Good morning. morning. The grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with you. It's a special joy this morning to welcome to the pulpit Reverend Dr. Jack Kenton. Jack has been a part of the ministry team of this congregation since 2002 and has been recognized as Minister Emeritus since 2009. Jack undoubtedly has touched, his ministry has touched most all of our lives in some way gathered here today. And Jack has uh, served, this is his 69th year in ministry. And uh, I can attest that in all my years of serving, Jack has been one of those I've always looked up to and always had a great deal of respect for his leadership and his ministry throughout the years. And he's also been a, a mentor to me. And I, I, as I said in earlier service, when I was found that I was coming here, one of the joys I had of coming here was that I knew I'd get to work with Jack. I was tickled about that. We uh, welcome Jack today to the pulpit, and Jack, we look forward to the words that the Lord has given you. Expecting that. <laughs> uh, grace and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I wonder, I haven't preached for this. Uh, congregation for some time, but I noticed you all sitting in the same places, and, uh, <laughs> so I can, I can recognize who's here and who isn't. <laughs> Although I wasn't sure when they made the announcement that I was going to preach what kind of reaction it would get, I was reminded of a story they used to tell in my hometown of Benton, Kentucky, where the the uh, Methodist church was on a square and you had about 14 steps to get up to where you entered the sanctuary. One Sunday morning, one of the elderly women in the church, one of the faithful members was standing at the bottom of the, of the steps and said to the usher at the top, "Would young man, would you please help me get up these steps? And he said, sure. And so he came down and took her arm and got up to the top of the steps and he she thanked him, and then, then she said to him, oh, by the way, is Reverend Clark preaching this morning? He said, no, we have a guest preacher. The district superintendent's here. She said, well, in that case, just walk me back down those steps. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope that was not your response. I think not since you got a standing ovation. I'm also pleased to thank the the staff that's here, I mean, all the ministers are here and everything, they've got to listen to this thing three times, so uh, I, uh, I feel sorry, but, but welcome, and it's, it's uh, my pleasure to speak to you again. This is a wonderful church. Uh, I've been here longer, actually, than I was in, in any one church uh, as a minister. The only person here, the people here I know that's been to annual conference longer than I have are Jim and Ida Holmes out here who are faithful members of this congregation as well. When Tim asked me uh, uh, to preach, or I'd like to preach, and he gave me a, uh, several dates. I chose this Sunday because it's uh, uh, annual conference begins today at uh, the 180th annual conference of the Methodist Church. It begins in Cairo. And for me, it's, uh, it's a historic time because I am attending consecutively the 72nd annual conference. That's a long time to be in Methodist meetings. And uh, so I decided I wanted to use this scripture this morning. Uh, my text is from, uh, from the book of Acts from that 26th chapter, the ninth, beginning of the 19th verse, where the Apostle Paul says to King Agrippa, Oh, King Agrippa, I have not been disobedient to my, my heavenly vision. 
I have proclaimed it in Damascus and in Jerusalem and to all the countryside of Judea and now to the Galilees, saying to them, repent and turn to God and do deeds that are keeping with repentance. He was defending his faith. I want to do that in a sense this morning, defend my faith as a United Methodist and as a United Methodist minister. Now, you got to know that uh, I'm a little prejudiced because I've been a United, I've been a, minister, a Methodist all of my life. I, I was baptized as an infant in Mount Carmel Methodist Church then, and I joined the church when I was 10 years of age. I went to Lambeth. Uh, college, which was a Methodist school. I went to Emory, which was a Methodist school, and I graduated from Vanderbilt, which used to be a Methodist school. So I'm truly a Methodist. I'm so Methodist that when I was preaching in Jackson one day, I went to the post office and asked for stamps, and the, and the clerk said, what denomination? And I said, Methodist. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's how Methodist I am. So I, I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about uh, DNA of Methodism. DNA is an acronym for the deoxyribin nucleic acid. You know that that's the essential element that's in all forms of life. That's what tells us who we are. That tells us who we're kin to. It tells us who we all belong to who belongs together. And you see, I, I think there's a, a DNA of Methodism. And DNA of Methodism for me are those four corners that help us to establish our own faith and our own Christian persons and doing Christian living. They come from Wesley. Those are, uh, Wesley believed that the core of the Christian, our Christian faith, is revealed in scripture. It's illumined by tradition. It's deified by, by experience, and it's confirmed by reason. And he looked at, I'd like for us to look at these this morning for a few minutes, each one of these. When it comes to scripture, we believe that scripture is a living word of God. It's come to us from uh, persons uh, of, of religion, persons, it's, it's, they've come, it's come from persons who knew God. It's not, uh, it's not as if God dictated to thus the Bible as you would dictate a letter, but it's, it comes to us from people who uh, are trying to help us to understand who God is. And it's written, it began for, firstly as oral tradition, and then it was written down. It's written by different people. But I believe all of these people were inspired by God to write what they wrote. And it's important for us to read what is written. But we also need to read even with a critical eye. And that's okay. Wesley believed that. Believe that it's open to criticism, but it's open also for our understanding. And so you read it something in kind of a context. You read it in when it was written, who wrote it, to whom it was written, why it was written. And so we, we learn and see how important scripture is to us. Uh, there's some parts of scripture we don't understand. I don't understand, and I've, I've read the Bible through once, more than once, and I'm sure many of you have. But as, uh, as Mark Twain said, it's not the part of the Bible I don't understand that bothers me, it's the part that I do understand. And we understand enough to know that the Bible, whatever is contained in scripture, is enough for our salvation. And so scripture uh, is first, but we also have, we, we believe that the word of God didn't end just with scripture. Harold Beck, who Dr. Harold Beck was a long time 
a professor at uh, Boston University who was often heard to say the worst thing we ever did in the Bible was put a back cover on it. That we ought to be open to Scripture and what Scripture is telling us. And we ought to see how God continues to speak to us and how we can learn new and different things as we read it. And so Scripture is, first of all, that what helps us to determine our own beliefs. You see, I believe as a Methodist minister, it's not our job to tell you what to believe. It's our job to help you to begin to understand your own beliefs and how you can develop those as you live out your Christian life. So we begin with scripture. As Wesley said, the core of our Christian faith is revealed in scripture. It's illumined by tradition. He wasn't, when he talked about tradition, he wasn't talking about the seven last words of the church, which, which is, we never did it that way before. No, our, our idea of tradition is that uh, we build on what we have learned from those who have gone before us. I love the story of the little girl that's riding on her grandfather's shoulder, and they came to a friend they hadn't seen for a long time. And the friend looked at the little girl and said, my, how you have grown. And she said, well, not all of this is me. And that's true. Not all of who we are is who we are. It's who have influenced us in our lives. You can look back in your own memory and pick out those persons that made a difference. When I think about scripture and my interest in scripture, I'm reminded of my preschool teacher. Uh, at that little old Mount Carmel church in Marshall County, Kentucky. Her name was Mrs. Jim Harrison. She taught the card class. Do you remember any of you here old enough to remember when you had a card class? Every Sunday in that class, we were given a card with a verse of scripture on it and a picture that descri helped describe that scripture. And we talked about it, and she encouraged us to memorize that scripture that week so that we could come back next Sunday to Sunday school and repeat it to her. That's the thing that started me trying to memorize scripture. Because you see, in that tradition of memorizing scripture can mean so much to you. It can help you go to sleep at night. It can help you wake up in the morning. It can help you in times of trial. It can help you in times of joy. Scripture is important but it also needs to be illumined by our tradition. It's not only our own personal tradition, but there's also the tradition of the church. We go all the way back, uh, back to uh, Abraham and Sarah and to Moses and to Isaiah and to Jesus and to, to Paul, and we come down to Martin Luther and John Wesley and all those persons that have influenced our lives. You see, it's a long way from the New Testament to where we are today. There's a lot that's taken place in between and that's part of our tradition. It's starting to make us who we really are. So you see, scripture uh, reveals to us the core of our Christian faith. Tradition illumines that and also experience enlightens it. You see, Wesley believed that our Christian life should be more than just coming to worship or even to help somebody, but it ought to be a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what John's gospel is talking about in this 15th chapter. He no longer calls us servants. He calls us friends. You see, as we're believers in Jesus Christ, he wants to be friends with us. And how we become friends with Jesus is through personal experiences. Paul had his personal experience on the Damascus Road. John Wesley had his personal experience on that um, little meeting on Aldersgate Street when he felt his heart strangely warm. And it wasn't from some exciting sermon that was preached. It was somebody who was reading the preface, reading Luther's preface to the Book of Romans. But something happened to him in that, and he felt that his heart was changed, strangely warm, and that Jesus loved him, even him, and it made a difference in his life. It makes a difference in the lives of all of us. I never, have, I never had an experience like John Wesley or Paul on the road to Damascus, but I've had experiences all of my life. I had experiences at Lakeshore when we put a candle on a paper plate and sealed it out in the night and made our 
confession of faith. I've had and those kind of personal relationships when I baptized a baby, especially when I baptized one of my grandchildren or our great grandbaby. I've had those kind of experiences when I performed a wedding, telling these people that allowed God to make become a part of all of their decision making. I've had those experiences when I've been with families and we put somebody to their final rest and we celebrate their life. You have all kinds of opportunities for personal experiences with Jesus Christ, and it makes all the difference. You see, Scripture reveals to us the core of our faith, and tradition illumines and, and, tradi and experience beautifies it, but reason really confirms it. Wesley, you see, grew up in the 18th century in the age of enlightenment. Everybody thought, you could prove something by science, so our reason that was that was what was important. Wesley helped to teach us. There's also importance that you put together faith and reason, that you put together in your in your religion, in your Christian faith, both religion and reason. You see, Wesley believes that you don't you don't have to leave your brain at the door when you come into the sanctuary to worship. Well, you see, early on in our church, we were not only interested in saving souls, we also were interested in teaching Christians how to better lead their lives. See, our responsibility is to help you interpret your own Christian beliefs, help you to establish those, help you to grow in them through scripture and tradition and experience and reason. We can't separate that because we all, our religion is connected to reason because ours is both of the heart and of the head. And so that's how I hope we all become better Christians living out our lives through the Methodist Church and that uh, we develop our own theology that we can be the people God would have us be. I also want to preach today because it's Holy Communion. You see, I think this is the most important thing you're going to do today is to take Holy Communion. We have two sacraments in the church. First is baptism. That's how you're initiated into the Christian faith. And then we have Holy Communion. That's how you rededicate yourselves. That's how you live out your baptismal faith. And you see, I think that's also a part of this, this whole thing of, of Scripture and, and tradition and experience and reason. It's scriptural. Jesus said, take this bread and eat it in remembrance of me. And take this cup and drink from it. It's the blood of the, of the New Testament and of my life. Do this in remembrance of me. It's scriptural. It's also traditional. In the Methodist Church, we come to the altar. This is God's table. It's open to anyone who will answer the invitation. So we come, and that's our tradition. And then you kneel here or you receive the cup. And when you leave this table, you leave a new person because your sins have been forgiven and you rise from here a new person. And the reason about it is it works, folks. I know, and I think you know too. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.